You know, there's been a lot written about AIDS, the disease called AIDS, and uh, the experiences of the AIDS patient uh, in the media. A lot of media about that. There have been movies about victims and their families, pilgrimages around the country, quilts being made, pictures being passed around of individuals who have died from this disease, countless books and articles written about the feelings, the frustrations of those who've been victimized by this uh, disease. And unfortunately, I have to say in all of this, Christians in general have uh, been relegated to being, um, from the media perspective, hard-hearted, perhaps narrow-minded people who don't care or simply condemn those with this terrible disease, especially when it's been contracted through homosexual uh, activity. In a lot of cases, the, these accusations are true, unfortunately. You know, Christians were quick to condemn and judge those with AIDS. At the beginning, I remember when this started, you know, there was a lot of accusations, condemnations, really quick to do that, but there was not a lot of help, not a lot of help uh, being offered to those individuals. I didn't see a lot of church groups you know, jump to the, this particular ministry to help people who had AIDS at the, at the beginning. And of course, a lot of Christians spoke out of anger and disgust or fear, rather than simply preaching the truth in an attitude of love about this particular sin, like we would about any other. Of course, what the media never does is report what the Bible actually says about these matters, and we don't expect them to do that. That's our job. And especially the parts which deal with the pain and suffering of those victimized by sin. You see, people are victimized by, by sin, whether it be the sin of greed, or the sin of pride, or the sin of sexual misconduct, or anger, any other sin, there are always consequences, you know? You know, both the Old Testament and the New Testament condemn in no uncertain terms the practice of uh, homosexuality. As a matter of fact, in the Bible it's so unheard of that this would happen, there's not even a word for this. The, the, the word homosexual is in the, in the English language, but in the original biblical languages you don't have that word. I mean, it's a long sentence. You know, Those who lie with men as, as one would lie with a woman. You know, they only describe the action. In Leviticus 18.22, the Bible says, do not lie with a man as one lies with a woman. That is detestable. And then in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9, Paul says, do you not know that the wicked will inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Oh, he says, do not be deceived. Why? Because there are a lot of people out there to deceive you that it isn't so. Well, listen to what he says, do not be deceived neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor male prostitutes, nor homosexual offenders. Very clear about this particular issue. Now, the Bible doesn't just condemn the sin. It also provides hope and encouragement to those who have sinned and suffer from the consequences of their sins. You know, a reminder here, you know, the reason that God condemns sin is that sin brings pain and suffering to the ones that He loves. He's not trying to take away any pleasure from us. He's not trying to take away any legitimate thing that, that we can have to enjoy in life. He forbids those things which will hurt us physically and spiritually. Now one such instance, <clears throat> talking about those who suffer from the consequences of sin, one such instance is a psalm, Psalm 6, written by David, who was no stranger to serious sin. Let's face it, if you racked up you know, David's sins, let's see, what have we got? We've got adultery, uh, we have premeditated murder, uh, we have political hypocrisy, we have Cover up, I mean it goes on, it's a long list of sins for David. And in this particular psalm, 
David, the one who is no stranger to sin and failure, David goes through the phases that every victim of sin must go through. And I include even the modern AIDS patient. In order to, re uh, to reach that place where one can have peace with self and peace with God. You know, I call Psalm 6 the sinner's psalm, or for more modern ears, the AIDS psalm, because in it David goes through all those phases that those who sin go through in order to reach the other side. You know, there is no certain history of this particular psalm. Many believe it was written after David had sinned with Bathsheba, or written during the time when David's own son rebelled against him and tried to kill him. Imagine a family situation where your own son is trying to kill you. Either way, it's written by a man who recognizes his own failures and is suffering because of the decisions and actions that he has made in his life. A very personal psalm. So let's read through it and let's see the in French we say le cheminement, you know. let's see the way, you know, the route that he takes, the journey that he takes through sinning and regretting and getting to the other side of it. And so read with me chapter six, beginning in verse one, he says, O Lord, do not rebuke me in your anger, nor chasten me in your wrath. And so here David expresses the natural human fear that the pain he is experiencing is the direct result of God's rebuke. In other words, he's thinking God is judging me right away. He's judging me now for what I've done wrong. You know, we often think that our illnesses or our misfortune is God directly showing His rejection of us. Now this is not what makes the suffering hard to bear. Or rather, this is what makes the suffering hard to bear, because we think God is causing it. You know, we've been bad and God has put this thing on us. Of course, there are times when God directly sends a curse, but usually He warns His people first when this happens. He warned the people with Noah, and Noah preached for decades. He warned Jerusalem for decades that they were sinning and they would be taken over and eventually the curse came. Eventually Nebuchadnezzar came and overran the city. You know, the Bible says that suffering is the result of sin, not God punishing or rejecting. Sometimes it's the direct result of sin. You, know, you steal, you get caught, you go to prison. You, know, you can follow the, you know, follow the lead there. Connect all the dots. Sometimes someone abuses alcohol and they're, they're sick because of it, physically ill. Individuals that um, participated in homosexual activity um, got AIDS, that's how it started. And so we see a direct relationship between the activities that we are in and the consequences that have taken place in our bodies because of it. But it's not always a direct consequence, right? Sin, not always that way. I mean, sometimes there's a, an indirect result. Perhaps a, an individual who is a homosexual, who has AIDS, uh, knowingly or unknowingly, uh, donates blood. And that tainted blood, of course, at the, it doesn't happen now, but at the very beginning, finds its way into the system and an, in, an, innocent, an innocent person simply gets a blood transfusion and, and, and they have the AIDS. They didn't do anything wrong, but they're the victims indirectly of someone else's sin. How about the drunk driver? You know, veers off into another lane, crashes into somebody's van, kills a woman and her child. Well, what did she do wrong? Nothing. She's the indirect victim of that other person's sin, that drunken driver. And so, getting back to our psalm here, the author hopes that God is not expressing His final judgment on it. Things are going badly. He's hoping, boy, I hope this is not the final judgment on me for what I've done. And in relation to what I'm talking about, AIDS, 
AIDS is not the final judgment of God. It's just the natural result of this particular sinfulness. You know, in the beginning, it was primarily spread through homosexual contact. I mean, it could have been avoided if God's commands against these things had been obeyed. God said, don't do that, that's a detestable thing. I forbid you to do that type of activity. It's in black and white, it's in the Old Testament, it's confirmed against in the New Testament, the language is clear, no amount of twisting can make it right, according to the, according to the Bible. I mean, the final consequence is that you're disobeying God, but there was also a temporal consequence in that that type of sexual activity the possibility of transmitting this disease uh, you know, happened. And individuals caught this disease, terrible thing, and then passed it on to other people. I don't think anybody wanted the AIDS. What they wanted was to have uh, the sexual relationship, but it was one that God forbade. And indirectly because of that, this disease happened. It didn't happen every time. It was just that if someone had that disease, they transferred it to someone else through sexual contact. So there they are. Individuals who weren't looking for that result have this terrible disease. Why? Well, indirectly because they disobeyed God's command. In verse two, the author says, be gracious to me, O Lord, for I am pining away. Heal me, O Lord, for my bones are dismayed. So here's a direct plea for healing. You know, once the individual begins to experience the pain and the ravages of the illness, the first and most natural thing to do is to ask God to make it go away. For some, this point is never reached because, well, they just don't have any faith. They deny it. They pretend that they can ignore or will it to go away. Or they drown their fear and anger and pain in the cause of their disease. They become martyrs for it. They become, when it comes to uh, AIDS, they become you know, AIDS activists and spokespersons. Raise money, we'll beat the disease, we'll beat the disease. Rather than getting on their knees and saying to God, have mercy on me, save me. You know, most die in ignorance, too proud to acknowledge the true cause of their death, preferring to die without remorse than having a life of repentance, not all, but many of you know that I produced a book on this topic many, many years ago and so came into contact with many homosexuals, lesbians, and many people who treated them and people who had AIDS. And I was amazed at the militancy of some of these individuals who were deathly ill and suffering. It was pitiful, it was terrible, but the last thing they would ever do is renounce the very thing that had caused their disease. They preferred, not all, but many prefer to blame God for their disease. It's His fault rather than blame themselves. And here the author of this psalm is crying out to God. He's not one of those that you know, shakes his fist to heaven. No, he, he's crying out to God and he continues and he says, and my soul is greatly dismayed, but you, O Lord, how long? So either way, the believer and the disbeliever usually come to a point where reality can no longer be denied and death is imminent. Even when one comes to faith, sometimes there's no deliverance from death and this realization is always a surprise and a letdown. You know, just because you believe or just because you repent or just because you ask for healing doesn't mean that you will be. I remember one of the individuals who had contributed a lot to my book uh, had AIDS. And uh, of course, this was a long time ago. They were just beginning with the drugs and you know, what not to, to treat that disease. And uh, he had become a Christian. 
And uh, he was a very uh, strong Christian, a very strong faith. As a matter of fact, I invited him to come and speak at Oklahoma Christian and he spoke at chapel, 1,500 students. You could hear a pin drop when he walked out and I introduced him and, and the first thing he says, he says, well, I have AIDS. And boy, that got their attention. And he talked about his faith and he talked about hope and he talked about you know, how good God has been to him and so on and so forth. But you know what? He died. He died of AIDS. As a matter of fact, the day he died, the book, the portion of the book that he wrote for me, the book was published on the day that he died and so the postman had delivered the final book with his chapter in it, but he never got to see it. He died on that day. So just because you believe doesn't mean that you'll be healed. Just like the author is saying, Lord, how long? You're not healing me here. I'm crying out to you. And so we continue to read in verse four. He says, return, O Lord, rescue my soul, save me because of your loving kindness. For there is no mention of you in death, in Sheol, who will give you thanks? So here the believer and the unbeliever part company because one is savoring his last experience of earth and the other begins to reach out for the next experience of heaven. You know, you've seen that. People who resign themselves to their illness they have no faith in God or anything like that. What do they do? Man, I'm, I'm cashing in my check. I'm going to get a reverse mortgage, you know, selling the house. I'm going to Disneyland. I'm going to go around the world. I'm going to go on safari. I'm going to do all those things that I wanted to do. And I'm going to do that because this is all that I have. But here, this writer, in these verses, he recognizes that it is his soul that needs saving, not just his body. It's the soul that goes to Sheol here, you know, the place of the dead. Now this is a key moment in every person's life, whether he's afflicted with the disease or not. The realization that it's the spirit that lives and it's the spirit that lives on and we need to assure its progression. So the world keeps us busy taking care of our bodies, which everybody knows only have a limited time to function. And unfortunately, we ignore the important issue of our soul's salvation. The pain and the suffering of the writer has brought this point into sharp focus, as it does for most people who experience life-threatening situations. If only we could see it when we are well. Why does it always have to be death, the death of a loved one, or mortal illness? Why does it always have to be those things that finally get us to understand that it's the spirit that's important? It's the world that we're going to that is important. We don't think about that when we're well, when everybody is happy. In verse six he says, I am weary with my sighing. Every night I make my bed swim. I dissolve my couch with my tears. My eye has wasted away with grief. It has become old because of all my adversaries. So here the writer finally accepts his situation. Grief resolution counselors tell us that acceptance is not just accepting the reality of the situation. You know, the reality of the situation is, well, this is AIDS, or this is serious, or people die of AIDS. That's the, they say that's the reality. True acceptance is realizing and accepting that this is my reality. See the difference? I have AIDS. I am very sick. I am going to die. My loved one has only a few days left. My marriage is, you understand what I'm saying? It's when you own the thing that you are close to accepting the thing. And so in accepting his situation, David acknowledges that the disease, 
that the suffering has won over the body and all the tears and anger and rationalization or prayers are not going to change things at this point. Sometimes you know, our faith must accept that a good God has allowed a bad thing to happen to us irregardless of whether we deserve it or not. You know, those are the mature things of life. You know, whoever wins the Super Bowl, those are not the mature things of life. Who wins the Academy Award, those are not the important things of life. In verse eight he says, Depart from me all you who do iniquity, for the Lord has heard the voice of my weeping, the Lord has heard my supplication, the Lord receives my prayer. All my enemies will be ashamed and greatly dismayed. They shall turn back. They will suddenly be ashamed. Well here now, here for the first time, faith does have the last word, even if disease has a momentary, a momentary say. Here the author makes a cry of victory in the knowledge that God will save the soul even if he allows the body to be claimed by the disease. You see what I'm saying? In this case, the enemies of faith and goodness have lost their battle to force their victim to abandon God because of the suffering. Because sometimes Satan uses suffering in order to destroy our faith. The argument goes like this. If he really loved you, Really, if God really loved you, would He put you through all of this? Really? That's the voice of Satan. That's not the voice of God. That's not the voice of Jesus. In the psalm, David personifies the enemy as being ashamed because it has taken a life, yes, but it has failed to destroy a soul. In the end, the soul will live on to glorify God in eternity, defeating the enemy who tried to dishonor it by turning it away to disbelief and to despair. See, a lot of times what's happening is that we're not only fighting a battle because of physical illness or physical adversity, but at the same time we're fighting a battle on two fronts. That physical attack is also creating an attack on our faith. And here the author is saying, maybe the body's losing, but the spirit is still strong. I still believe. How many people in the Bible have kind of said this? It doesn't matter what you do to me. I'm, keep, I'm, I'm believing. You can throw me in the, in the furnace with the fire. You can do that if you want. And you know what? My God can save me if He wants. Maybe he will, maybe he won't, but it doesn't matter because I'm not going to disbelieve and I'm not going to disobey. How many people have been told, you, you better stop talking about that Jesus guy, you're causing trouble, sorry. I know what I know, I've seen what I've seen. You, know, you beat me, whip me, kill me, do what you want. I, I can't deny what I've seen, I can't deny the truth. And sometimes we have to say this to Satan while we're suffering. You may be beating me up and you may be making my life miserable and okay, maybe there's nothing I can do about that, but you know what? One thing you're not going to make me do, you're not going to make me curse God. And you're not going to make me blame God. And you're not going to make me be mad at God. You're not going to do that to me. So do your best work, but you're not going to make me deny my Lord. The enemy tried to kill the soul by making it disbelieve because of the disease. And it didn't succeed, and that's what David is saying here. You know, to die of AIDS is no dishonor if one dies in Christ. Because you know what? Everybody dies from something. Everybody dies from something. You know, I don't think too many of us have AIDS here tonight. <laughs> Maybe, but I don't think so. But there are some lessons from all of us 
from this song. And I want to share those with you and then the lesson will be yours for tonight. Lesson number one, very obvious, it's not disease that kills us, it's sin that kills us. Romans 6, 23. The wage of sin is death. The wage of sin is death. Disease, accidents, old age, they do the job. But it's sinfulness that destroys both our bodies and our souls. In order to deal with death, we must deal with the sin in our lives, not just the disease in our lives. Another lesson, an obvious one, faith is what saves us. Paul says in Romans 5, 1, therefore having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. He doesn't say having been justified by activism, having been justified by finding the cure, having been justified by raising money, building hospitals. He doesn't say that. Those are not bad things but those are not the things that justify us. He says, having been justified by faith, what do we have? We have peace with God. And I'll tell you something, when you are very, very sick, the thing you want is peace. You know, miracle drugs, medical breakthroughs can slow down the disease or buy us a few more months or years. But the final solution to the inevitable death caused by sin is to be forgiven for those sins and guarantee our eternal lives in heaven with God. Jesus did not come to save our bodies. He didn't come to save our countries. He didn't come to save our earth. He came to save our souls from the sure destruction that they will undergo. You know, let's face it, something is going to get us. If not AIDS, then a drunken driver, or a heart attack, or cancer. But those in Christ will have no fear, no regrets, because like David, they will have understood that it's the soul that needs saving. It's the soul that lives forever, not the body. So I hope that none of you or none of yours will ever experience the terrible disease that we call AIDS, a terrible thing. Suffering is terrible. People who have that deserve our pity and our prayers and our help. I hope all can live long enough to see Christ come with His angels to take us away to be with Him in heaven. But if we don't make it to that day, let's be sure that our souls are safe with God through faith in Jesus expressed in repentance and baptism, make sure we do that and not worry so much about the body. The body will go sooner or later. The soul will remain if the soul is in Christ.